So, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, that I often say is like, we try to study bacterial death. And, um, you know, the analogy that I oftentimes use is it's like playing Clue, but on the molecular scale. So if you can imagine that it, over the host, over the history of kind of the study of the immune response to pathogens, you know, people have identified that they think this is the like molecular mechanism that drives bacterial control. And some people argue that it's this. And so you can imagine it's kind of like if you think about the game of Clue, where it's like, you know, you know, Professor Fudge, you know, use the knife in the in, in the lit library. And then, you know, this other character use this. You know, what we try to really understand at the molecular level is how do all those parts come together, right? So if you think like, okay, the immune response has all of these different molecular weapons, so to speak, against the pathogen in its arsenal, what are the actual weapons that one, function against the bacterium? And two, which are the ones that can actually be used in a natural setting to eliminate the bacterium? And so, Obviously, one of the things that's really challenging is how do you actually measure all of these different molecular weapons at the same time? So one of the things that my lab does is we actually develop techniques that allow us to characterize every individual known and implicated weapon, so to speak, or molecular mechanism of bacterial control. And then we try to understand, okay, well, in this setting, when we treat the cells with this, this bacteria don't die, but all these weapons get turned on. But in this setting, when we use these sets of stimuli, the bacteria do get controlled and we get an orthogonal set of molecular weapons being turned on. So that gives us an association that we can then begin to tease apart um, because we said these things weren't, went on when they didn't die and these things went on when they did. And then we can begin to tease apart what's going on there. And then we kind of iterate to try to really try to create as much diversity in our system. And then what we do is now we've got a lot of data. So we get what we use our machine learning algorithms to try to identify what are the relevant patterns. So to me, it really starts with this game of molecular clue, but then the data, the, um, my, um, my naive brain cannot handle the amount of data that we ultimately generate. And then we turn it over to the computer to find the patterns. Um, Work in my group is really uh, distributed ag again across this question of like how do you how do you kill the bacterium and how, and how do you tar uh, target the immune system uh, in a way that will actually allow you to get the infected cells to do what you want to do. And so, um, one of the almost simple basic questions that nobody has really um, answered is, you know. At the at the organismal level, if you see a person, you know that, and we have really great ways to diagnose that a individual is infected with TB. At the cellular level, we actually lack really great techniques to identify here is a, t a cell that is infected with TB. And so one of the questions that we've been working on in my group is trying to understand how do immune cells report their infection status. So there's a lot of ways that you can do this, but there's not a lot of ways that you can use this in a way that turns into a therapeutic outcome. So obviously when, an, when a cell gets infected, it starts you know, spewing out a whole bunch of proteins to say, hey, I'm infected. But that's not something that is like, when you have a molecule that's diffusing away from a cell, that's not something that you can really associate with the cell that's infected. So what we've been actually doing is leveraging these concepts from cancer immunotherapy and asking, okay, well, here I've got a cell infected with TB. Does the cell itself change what proteins are on the surface of the cell as a marker of I'm infected? And if you can imagine if the cells had such a molecular beacon, then you could either, you could begin to develop a whole host of different strategies that would one, allow you to target those proteins on the surface. Two, it would out actually allow you to uh, come up with new non-invasive ways to monitor TB disease. Like our pie in the sky dream is to identify those proteins that come to the surface of an infected cell when the bacterium is still alive. But when the bacterium dies, the protein disappears. And there's actually really great ways it, uh, that we can actually leverage this to really study how new uh, antibiotic regimens could be developed, how new vaccines could be developed. This, I think, could actually really dramatically change 
how we do the science itself because it would decrease the cost of any experiment because right now to be able to ask did I kill the bacterium? You have to sacrifice your cells. You have to sacrifice your organism. You have, or and then you have, and you can't go back once you've harvested your mouse, say for example. But if you had a non-invasive way to begin to monitor what the bacterial burden is inside an organism, well then you've got a whole lot of different things that you can begin to do. And so that's one of the things that we spend a lot of time is trying to develop a cellular level diagnostic assay that would allow us to identify infected cells and track disease dynamics non-invasively in people. And this doesn't just have to be for TB, it could be for any bacterial pathogen. And so that's one of the things that gets us really excited because again, it will allow us to generalize, but we're focusing first on TB because of the obvious area for impact.